So I did my presentation on the second paper on alchemical perturbations. Uh, next slide, please. Can you see the next slide, drug discovery? Uh, no. Oh, sorry about that. It's been clunky. Okay, so alchemical perturbations are used a lot in drug discovery, which is the process of discovering drugs. Uh, but this process relies on synthesizing as many possible as many possible ligands as you can to bind to your selected target. Uh, the best the best possible ligand will be dictated by the binding affinity and the free energy. So you can you can determine these values experimentally, but they can take those experiments can take a long time and they're cost worthy. And instead, you can approximate these values with molecular dynamics. Uh, next slide, please. So molecular dynamics basically models the movement of different compounds, usually your uh, ligand and its binding target using a variety of force fields. So it's, it simulates the ligand moving away or into your binding site and the surrounding environment, which you can usually in some sort of cubic cell, like you can see in the image on the right here, uh, estimates the partition function to solve for free energy and plots mean force, usually in one of two ways. You have the steered method or the umbrella sampling method. Uh, next slide, please. Then the version that this paper mostly focused on, on was alchemical perturbations, which is an application which applies perturbation theory, which basically it transforms some molecules on your reference molecule into into others sometime or it will transform them into non-interacting dummy atoms and you can calculate relative free energy based on those transformations uh, next slide please so the alchem the alchemical perturbations and molecular dynamics in general can provide free energy values at relatively close to experimentally obtained values uh, it can decrease the number of compounds you need, to, the number of leads you would need to synthesize by a factor of three. Uh, and alchemical perturbations have been shown to have a greater her accuracy to a, a better accuracy to experimental results than some of the other molecular dynamic simulations that were previously mentioned, the steered and umbrella sampling. And I believe that is it. Okay, good. Thanks, Thomas. So, uh, and we have one speaker left. We have Gion left. I believe everyone else is done, right? So, who do I have here? This is Gion. Becca already did it. So, yeah, only Gion is left. Okay. So, Gion, are you there? Yes. Okay, great. So, let me do screen share again. Okay, your time starts now. Yep. Um, hi, I'm Jian, and I'm going to talk about free energy calculation method today. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, I'm sorry, I cannot see the slide. Sorry about that. It's, it's been clunky. Let's start once again. The green protein and brown ligand. Each of them is microstate. Um, next slide, please. And we can get the partition function from this equation one, and also we can get delta G using equation two. Those equations might be familiar with you guys. The thing we have to, uh, sorry. <laughs> oh, yeah, uh, the thing we have to focus on the, uh, is this delta G. This paper is introducing several stories regarding this delta G, which is the energy difference between two states unbound state and bound state. Next slide, please. This paper is using molecular dynamic simulation, which is called as MD simulation. Um, first, we, you have to know that it is better to restrict the ligand to save computer time than to leave it to move freely. You can see this picture that ligand is bound to the protein at the first time, 
and you can also see that each ligand is restrained at fixed position in second picture. There are two approaches to get the potential of mean force, which is PMF. A force is applied that pulls the ligand away from the protein. One of them is stilled MD, and the other one is the method which uses umbrella sampling. Both are used to calculate the average potential energy, but the first one is conducted under non-equilibrium conditions, and the second one uses a ser series of equilibrium simulations. Next slide, please. Um, in this paper, it is very important to know about the concept of lambda, which ranges between zero, representing initial state, and one, representing final state. It is used to move from initial to final states smoothly. Appropriate number of intermediate steps, which means lambda states, are required to do accurate and efficient alchemical perturbation calculation. There are two types of transformation, in figure A, it moves to the related chemical spaces, and in figure B, it moves to the dummy atoms that are invisible to the surrounding environment. Next slide, please. There are two types of free energy calculations, which is absolute or relative manners. Type B in the previous slide is used to absolute one, and type A is used for relative one. Relative free energy calculations are more accurate than the absolute one. The reason is that two states of relative one look similar because both have ligands, but two states of absolute one does not. Next slide, please. I drew this picture about the absolute of free energy perturbation, which contains lambda concept. You can see the ligand goes to the dummy state during the simulation. I wanted to deliver the key concept, so I will skip the information about accuracy and the history of the methods at the end of the paper. That's all, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Ian. So that finishes everyone's presentations. Thank you. Okay, so now let's go back to the actual class material. Okay, so you guys see my iPad screen? You see a picture that I copied from somewhere? I'm not gonna record it in the... I got this picture from Professor Michael Klein, who is at uh, Temple University. And he is someone who has been doing all this business molecular dynamics and everything since 1960s. And I found this to be a very amazing picture. It really shows you what happened, started happening around 1950s. So 1950s, Los Alamos National Lab after Cold War got hold of one of the first supercomputers, it was called Maniac. Many of you might have heard about uh, some of these computers. Which was the first one? Before, there, is, there is one which is more famous. What's, what's the name? I'm blanking. Anyone remembers? Which was the first big computer, first computer? No one remembers the name? The ENIAC? Huh? ENIAC? I think it was ENIAC, right? ENIAC, Electronic Numerical Integrator and Calculator. ENIAC was even before that. And it sounds like ENIAC must be a bit, it's calling it a supercomputer is really, a, it's, it's, it's being liberal a bit too much. I mean, ENIAC had probably one millionth of the computer power of a modern iPhone, if not less than that, perhaps even more. It was, its memory was probably less than a floppy disk you, you, uh, has anyone here used a floppy disk in the class? Is there a single person who has used it? Yeah, I mean, a long, long time ago. Yeah, long time ago. Oh, you guys are not that old then. I thought I am really old for having used floppy disk at some point. Okay, so they are really uh, hopeless, right? So these computers, it came out in 19, Maniac related to a couple of things. First of all, it led to this algorithm called the Metropolis algorithm, which really led to the birth of Monte Carlo simulations. And a year late, or the same year, 
uh, Fermi, Pasta, and Ulam published a paper on nonlinear coupled oscillators where they showed that by adding a slight nonlinear term, they can get non ergodic behavior. It was one of the first times this was shown in a computer simulation. That was published as an internal report. Uh, this lady, Mary, did most of the work on it. Her name was not there first, from what I understand. It was later added to it. I might be wrong here. There's a lot of history on this. There is a nice video by Michael Klein from where I uh, bor uh, borrowed this slide on YouTube. I can send you the link if you want, which talks about all of this in great detail. And uh, this paper is also very interesting because it has the one I'm showing you right now, the Journal of Chemical Physics paper. It has a lot of uh, women authors. Back in the day, apparently many times women would work on the project and their names would be removed from the papers. You might have seen this in the context of NASA and many things that used to happen back then. So it was nice that everyone was actually uh, acknowledged. And Edward Teller was of course very famous. He won the Nobel Prize. So we are going to understand this method. It's not that complicated. It's actually, I don't even have any lecture slides for this. I'm just going to tell you what the method is because it's so simple and I've coded for the first time as an undergrad. So it's uh, remembered way too well. So let's start with an overall picture. Why do we need computational methods? So by looking at the papers that uh, we reviewed in the second midterm, not all of you removed, reviewed the free energy perturbation method uh, paper, but you, some of many of you did actually, I think it was the number one paper that you reviewed and uh, uh, all of you listened to the presentation. So you got, you came to know about molecular dynamics. Molecular dynamics is solving force is equal to mass times acceleration. So you get the force, which is called a force field by fitting to quantum mechanics or to experiments. Gion here works with Jeff Clauda in the chemical engineering department, who is, for example, an expert on how to get these force fields. That's a hard problem. Once you have a force, and you know the mass of a certain atom, you can go and calculate the acceleration with which that atom moves. So, and what is acceleration? Acceleration is d square x by dt square, right? Change in position. So what you're saying is that acceleration is equal to force by mass, which is equal to minus one over m dv by partial v by partial x. So now you can solve this equation. It's a differential equation. You can solve this for x and you can solve this for dx by dt by integrating and then you can integrate dx by dt to get x and you so you can essentially get x t plus delta t as a function of x t plus some other terms that you get by solving all of this and you can evolve the system as a function of time so this delta t in molecular dynamics happens to be around one to two femtosecond that's the number that is kept the reason why you keep it so fast is because hydrogen atoms vibrate with that frequency around one every femtosecond. So if you make it any slower, if you make it any longer, this delta t in the integration, then uh, the method will be inaccurate. It won't work. How do you check it will be inaccurate? It's very easy. You have all studied about the NVE ensemble, right? Where there is total energy should be conserved. So if you use this equation in an NVE ensemble, if you set it up on a computer and you monitor your total energy as a function of time, and if your delta t is too large, you will find that your total energy starts to drift. It starts to behave like this, if delta t too large. For small enough delta t, the total energy will actually be constant. It will be constant if delta t is small. And if you want to talk more about this, my student Connor is in the audience who I had worked through this in he wrote a molecular dynamics code where he actually saw this and he can uh, he if you want he can show you his slides as to how this really looks like or you can look it up in papers so that's molecular dynamics as you can see the time step is very very small now if you have a protein made up of n atoms or some material made of some battery material or whatever made up of n atoms in order to advance the clock by one femtosecond you will have to solve around order of n square equations of motion. So why? Because you have to do force equal to mass time acceleration for every pair of atom, right? So it's going to be a very, very slow process. If, if your n is 10 to the power 5, which is much smaller than Avogadro number, still you will have to solve 10 to the power 10 equations of motion to advance your clock by one femtosecond. So it's a very slow process. That is what has led to these other methods, such as tiered molecular dynamics, umbrella sampling, 
These two you have encountered in the paper. Metadynamics you did not encounter in the paper. This is something I have been working over the years. These are all methods that speed up the process of molecular dynamics. Steered MD is something I would like to talk about a little bit because you saw it in the paper. What it does is to really, it takes, it makes spaghetti out of everything. You know, it takes any little thing and just pulls it with lots and lots and lots of force. It's highly non-equilibrium. So, so in fact, I'm not going to talk about insulin island. So let me remove that. So, so what does steered MD do? It pulls at a finite rate. So you have a drug inside the protein, or you have, you have an ion inside the battery, which has to move from spot one to start spot two. It will move due to thermal fluctuation, but you kind of just force it to move in a very non-equilibrium manner from point, point one to point two. So what you do in steered MD is you calculate the work done on the system. And you know, as per second law of thermodynamics, that the work done on the system will always be greater than or equal to the free energy difference, right? That's second law of thermodynamics if in order to go from point A to point B. In steered MD, you calculate work done and you know that this will be always greater than the free energy difference. So you can get some estimate of the free energy difference by doing steered MD. But this is an inequality. Almost all the times, this left-hand side is way bigger than the right-hand side. You never get there. Steered MD became very popular suddenly in the late 90s when Jar Zinsky, your, our professor in chemistry and my colleague, he came up with the Jarzinski relation which said that in, so this is in equilibrium or non-equilibrium, right? It's an inequality. Jarzinski's relation took this and showed that instead of doing this averaging, if you do the averaging of e to the power minus dead blue AB, average that exponential, then it will be equal to e to the power minus delta f. And this averaging can be equilibrium or non-equilibrium. It doesn't have to be an equilibrium pathway. You could pull the system in whatever way you want. So this is known as Jarzinski relation. It, it, in, in 30 years or so, it, 25 years, it already has many thousand citations. That led to a lot of hope because all these people doing steered MD thought, I will pull my system in as aggressive or may as way as possible and I will go and use Jarzinski's relation to get the free energy. But now you are all experts on perturbation relations and things like that. And you should realize that if the work done is too high, why this relation might not be as useful as people first thought, right? Because you would be averaging something which is very, very small. So that's why it might not be very practical. It's, a, it's an exact relation, it's an identity. But in steered MD, if you're not careful, the number of paths that you need to take in order for this left-hand side to converge to the free energy can be very, very high. So you can go and read more on Jarzinski relation. So that makes steered MD a bit practical. Before Jarzinski relation, steered MD was not even very practical. Umbrella sampling is yet another method where you try to force the system to stay in different locations. So let's say you are interested, let's say this is a crystal made up of many different atoms and you have an interstitial atom over here and you are interested in how what is the pathway taken by this interstitial to move as it gets to the other location right so in umbrella sampling what you would do is to prepare many copies of the system one where the interstitial is here let's call it one second time you will put the interstitial over here let's call it two this one, let's call it three. You will create many, many copies of the system. Let's say you create 50 copies of the system along this quote unquote reaction coordinate. It's an approximation to the reaction coordinate. And then you force the system to stay there. How do you force that? You apply a biasing force, which the biasing force looks like an umbrella. That's where it comes from. Forcing the system to stay where you want it to, forcing the system to stay where you want it. So then what happens is you essentially make estimates of the partition function restricted to one, partition function restricted to two, partition function restricted to three. You make local estimates of the partition function and then you 
tailor them together. I'm going to write it as a plus with quotes because it is in no way an addition. You tailor them together. This is not an addition, just to be very clear. You tailor them, you patch them plus Z2, plus Z3. So you have all this local information of the partition function and you have to patch them together. The way you patch them together is by introducing coefficients, A, B, C, blah, blah, blah. And it becomes an optimization problem. It becomes an optimization problem to find A, B, C. So by making local estimates of the partition function, you can then patch them together and come up with the true partition function. And then you can make comparisons of what was the free energy difference between the high, top of the barrier over here versus in the bottom and things like that. So this optimization problem is not exactly trivial. I'm not going to talk about it in the class. Chandler's book does talk about umbrella sampling, so you can go and read it there, how this is done. This is all Molecular Dynamics, and Molecular Dynamics tends to be slow. It gives you information about the true dynamics, as the name itself says dynamics, but it is very, very slow. So there are lots and lots of methods that people have developed over the years. My lab is also working on this, how to make it faster. There is an alternate approach. So, but what does molecular dynamics do? It essentially gives you the partition function. It allows you to simulate the equilibrium probability distribution of a system, but it's very slow. So there is another approach, which is called Monte Carlo simulation. That also allows you, among other things, to generate the partition function of the system. You lose dynamical information. So no dynamics here. You can kind of introduce dynamics in approximate ways, but otherwise there is no dynamics. And uh, no dynamics and simulates any given probability distribution. So let's see. What does this mean? This is something which is very practical and intuitive. So let's say I want you to generate a random number between one and two, okay? And let's say the probability of generating, of finding any, I want you to generate a random number between one and two, where I'm telling you that the probability of finding any such number is constant in this interval. So I don't want you to prefer, let's say 1.1 over 1.8. I want you to generate any number in this domain. That's easy, right? How would you do this in a computer code? Anyone wants to help me? How would you write a computer code that generates a random number between one and two? I see Suhas, I'm gonna start with Suhas. Tell us Suhas. Um, I don't know, actually, I would use a predetermined function, but you're asking how to write the function. So I don't know. No. So let's see, how would you do it? You would use a function that, yeah, you're right. And in, in a sense, you have to use some internal function. So let's say you have a function. Okay. Let me make your life easy. Let's say that I give you access to has to a function that generates a random number which lies anywhere between minus infinity and plus infinity. Mm -hmm. Given this, how would you help me generate a number that lies between one and two? Uh, I would take that number from minus infinity to plus infinity mm -hmm. and maybe divide it by a factor. Or check whether it lies in that interval or it. not. Yeah, exactly. You would just check it, right? If the yeah. number, you would write two if loops. If I will call it Suhas, more than one, and... The screen's frozen. Oh, that's a nine. Sorry. My wife is also teaching in the next room. Normally she does these asynchronous videos, which is... Anyway, and uh, today she is not doing asynchronous. So anytime I try to pair my iPad, it gives me the option of my wife's iPad. And we are using the same network. So in principle, I could zoom bomb her class. It's, it's some mineralogy class. I think, don't think they will like what we are doing here. So if Suhas more than one, and Suhas less than two, then accept 
otherwise reject, right? Yeah. Otherwise reject. That's the simplest way of doing it. Now let's make our life a bit complicated. Okay, thanks a lot. Let's make our life complicated. And now I tell you that let's say I'm going to generate this random number, but with a given probability distribution. I want you to generate random numbers so that most of them lie in the middle. But once in a while you get numbers which are very small and once in a while you get numbers which are very big. I am not stopping just at one. I am allowing you to get numbers as small as even negative numbers, for example, if you want, or even very, very large numbers. All I'm saying is the mean should be 1.5. On an average, your number should correspond to 1.5. So here what we are saying is, so if, if you have used MATLAB or something like this, what Suhas did over here was to draw a random number from a uniform probability distribution, right? In a given range. But now I'm telling you how to draw random numbers from a given generic probability distribution. And the reason why I picked Monte Carlo to discuss here as, as compared to molecular dynamics, because many of you like, Mm, uh, Jess or Thomas or uh, uh, even Ben, possibly those of you who are doing experiments might not end up doing molecular dynamics. The odds though that you will be doing Monte Carlo simulations at some point in your scientific career or if you leave science and start your own hedge fund and become very, very rich, the odds that you do Monte Carlo simulations are extremely high. You will ask, your, you, your advisor might ask you some point, to go and reproduce some numerical experiment by doing a Monte Carlo simulation. And you're like, wait, what's Monte Carlo? It's a place somewhere, you know, what, what do I do that? So all Monte Carlo means is to draw random numbers from a given probability distribution and then use it to repeat your simulation. So for example, let's say X here is the diffusivity. Let's say you are doing an, an experiment. Let's say you have created a model where you're trying to monitor how does a given ion move from place one to place two, and you are getting all sorts of properties of this model. And let's say an input parameter in this model is D, okay? And experiments have told you that D has a certain value, D experiment, okay? But how much trust are you going to put into this experiment? Your advisor goes and tells you, well, it's great that you're getting these wonderful results if you take exactly this value that was published in some arcane paper in 1950s. But how about we allow some error in this value of the D experiment, right? How about we say that maybe the experiment was wrong and maybe the D could lie in this domain. Can you go and repeat your calculation for that? So now you will assume a model, right? You will say that I am willing to put trust in the experiment. So my model should be Gaussian. So my P of D should look like a Gaussian, right? It should be proportional to E to the power minus D minus D experiment whole square by two sigma square. So that's a Gaussian distribution, right? This distribution tells you that most of the time you trust the experiment, but you're willing to allow that maybe sometimes the experiment got it too high or maybe sometimes it got it too low. So now in order to repeat your calculation, you need to create values of the diffusivity coming from this distribution, right? So how would you do that? Any hints now? So has already helped me with the uniform random number. Now I'm asking you, how to generate random numbers from a given generic probability distribution, let's say a Gaussian probability distribution. How would I do that? You, you can do this in MATLAB, right? In MATLAB, you can go and ask it to generate MATLAB, Mathematica, whatever rules from alpha to generate random numbers from a probability distribution. I'm asking you to think, what if it that actually happens there? Any, any help for me? Luke, I cannot hear you. Um, if you have access to a uniform uh, sampler from zero to one, and if you know what P of X is, mm -hmm. you could um, sort of, uh, you get something from zero to one and start comparing it with what its P value is for your P of X. And okay, then? The, well, like you could have, you basically say, I'm gonna let this happen if your P value is, say you're near the top of the Gaussian and it's like 72, 0.72. Mm -hmm. And in your code, you say, I will let it through if the uniform number I get is over 0 0.72 or something like that, 
but so, yeah so luke is in the right direction luke is essentially trying to invent the algorithm that we are going to talk about next this is the metropolis algorithm okay that's what metropolis does in a systematic way so let's go through it carefully so the metropolis algorithm and apparently metropolis was just a guy who owned the computer so the full algorithm is metropolis hastings algorithm which is the journal of chemical physics 1953 and as you saw the paper has more than 40 40,000 citations, many people simply don't cite it. It's used in way more than 40,000 words. So let's think of it. It allows us to essentially generate probability distribution, numbers from a given probability distribution in a very efficient manner. Okay, and I will show you why it is so efficient by drawing from the example of an Ising model. So let's say I have a 2D Ising model. 2D Ising model where I have 20 spins in this direction and 20 spins in, in this direction, okay? So I have spin number one, spin number two, spin number three, dot, 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 and spin number four. And each spin can take value minus one and one. So I can now write down the energy function for this thing, E nu for any given microstate. What does that mean? That means any particular arrangement of S1, S2, S400 that, and I will, I will ignore, uh, we can have mag external magnetic field also, there is no problem. So minus uh, H or plus H, whichever way we defined it, SI multiplied by mu, if there is a magnetic moment, minus J, SI dot SJ, we could have nearest neighbors, we could have whatever, but we have a given energy, right? And uh, what Luke mentioned was to, once you have a given configuration, right? So you could, in order to sample one such configuration, how would it look like? It would maybe look like plus, 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 minus, 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 plus, 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 whatever. You could go and calculate the probability of this configuration, right? How would you calculate the probability of this configuration? It would require you to calculate E nu, and then you would calculate e to the power minus E nu over kT. That's not just the probability though, right? What is it missing? It's missing the beast of statistical mechanics, which is the partition function you have to sum over the probability over all microstates in order to get it. How many microstates does this system have? How many microstates would uh, 20 by 20 Ising model have? Now this is the last class of statistical mechanics, so I hope all of you can answer this question for me. So who wants to help me? That is Logan, I'm missing Logan. Logan, you there? Yeah, right here. Help me, Logan. Okay. Um, so you have two spins for each, um, and you have 400, so you would have uh, 400 microstates? No, no, think carefully. If you had a one cross one Ising model. Oh, you'd have two, so you'd have, so you'd have 400 times two, which is 800? Two to the power 400. Two to the four. Right? Yes. That's a very, very large number. That's a huge, huge number. So two to the power 400, what is two to the power two is around four, two to the power three is around eight. So this thing is around two to the power three uh, to the power 133. So this thing is around approximately, or two to the power four to the power 100. So this thing is approximately, it's, it's actually larger than 10 to the power 100, which itself is 10 to the power 23 multiplied by 10 to the power 23 multiplied by 10 to the power 23 or so. It's Avogadro number of Avogadro number of Avogadro number of configurations that you can have in order to calculate the partition function. It's huge. So if you try to do it in a brute force and try to sum up the partition function by going over all microstates, even for a 20 by 20 spin Ising model, it will take you more than age of the universe to do that, right? It's a very, very hard problem in order to do that. So we want, and, and why is it, why might that be useless? So what we are saying here is that in order to sum up Z is equal to summation over nu of E nu, where every nu takes me to some microstate and I calculate e to the minus E nu by kT. And what Logan just showed us is that this mu will involve two to the power 400 values. So if you wanted to do it exactly, 
But the question is, do we need to do it exactly? Most of these configurations would have an energy value which is very, very large, right? And they would not contribute. The probability distribution you all saw in the Gaussian, we saw in the very first part of the semester that in the limit of n tends to infinity, as you make 20 instead of 20, as you do 30 by 30, 40 by 40, 50 by 50, a canonical ensemble should start to look like a microcanonical ensemble, right? The energy fluctuations die. What does that mean? That most of the values different from the mean energy of the system, their probability will become smaller and smaller. They won't matter. So this doing it by hand to calculate the probability of a distribution, that's a very bad idea. So that's the problem in Luke's, in the Evans algorithm. If you wanted to apply it to a Ising model and you said that I will calculate the probability in order to do this, it would not work because in order to calculate the probability, you will need a normalization function. So how do you do that? So Metro Palace algorithm is a very simple way of doing it. And the story in that paper, and you guys can go and check, apparently in the appendix, it says somewhere that the idea goes back to John von Neumann, who was a very, very famous physicist. And apparently he just gave the idea to someone like, oh, why don't you do it this way? And that led to the algorithm, even though he's not a co-author. This has to be checked. The algorithm is quite simple. I will first give you the basic principle of the algorithm. The algorithm says that if you have a given probability distribution for a certain variable x, we have some p of x. Now x could be high dimensional, it doesn't have to be 1D, it could be very high dimensional. So when we are doing uh, I think model, x is 400 dimensional, right? You have 400 spins. And the probability distribution could be Gaussian, it could be anything that you want. So let's say you use Suhas's method of generating a uniform random number anywhere. And let's say you start over here, right? We start at x is equal to x naught. So this is a valid number. What we are trying to do, we are trying to do, so what is our objective? Our objective here is to generate a series of numbers, x1, x2, x3, x4, x100. Remember the experiment that you're trying to do? You're trying to generate a series of diffusivity values, d1, d2, d3, d100, so that the average of these diffusivities, which you calculate as i is equal to 1 to 100, di divided by 100, is the same as the experiment, right? You want on an average it to be the same. You also want the mean value, the deviation from the average, to be equal to sigma square, which is something you enforced in your experiment, the error margin that you allowed over the experimental measurement. So you want this distribution of values to be equal to this, equal to have these two properties. You might, for a Gaussian, two properties are sufficient, right? Because Gaussian has only two parameters. It has mean and it has noise. But you might have a complicated variable with many, many variables, uh, higher moments. And then you might want to preserve those also. So our objective is to, actually let's not call it x is equal to x naught, let's call it x is equal to x one. So let's say Suhas gave us one value, x is equal to x one. Now we want to generate a string of more values, x2, x3, x4, x5, so that when we go and do this test on them, we get the correct mean, the correct moments, other in, in more generic terms, we get the correct probability distribution. We want to make sure that our sampled x actually follow the probability distribution we wanted them to follow. For an I think model, we know they should correspond to this P mu over here. It could be something else. So how do we do that? Metropolis algorithm is really simple. What it says is to select, so in Metropolis, the first thing is to have an X naught. I keep writing X naught, let's call it X naught for start. Then you need a parameter epsilon, which is the perturbation you allow in the system, okay? So once you select, it, it has to be a small number. Once you have an epsilon, you move either to the left or to the right, okay? You pick randomly, whether you want to move to the left or you want to move to the right. Move to left or right with 50% probability. 50% of the time you move to left, 50% of the time you move to right. This piece, some people also might think of this like as a drunk gambler. So far, if 
if you just accepted. So when you do this, you generate an X trial, right? So this leads to an X trial, which could either be X plus epsilon. Uh, sorry, if you, if you move to the left, your X trial would be X minus epsilon. And if you move to the right, your X trial would be X, X1 plus epsilon, right? So depending on what you did, you generated a new value of X1. If you were doing just a uniform distribution, if your probability distribution was entirely flat, you would accept this X trial as X2 without thinking. Metropolis says, so um, I'm sorry for the next, so we will do this in the next page. Metropolis says that if probability of X trial was more than equal to probability of X1, then change X2 equal to X trial, okay? What does it mean? If your move was to the left direction, in this case, for this probability distribution, now the probability distribution could be very complicated, right? With lots of local minima and maxima and things like that. If your move was in the higher probability direction, then accept it, don't think about it, always accept it. However, so if, if this is the only thing you allowed, if you said that P of XT was less than P of X1, then keep X2 is equal to X1, right? This could be one option, option one. Metropolis doesn't do this, but let's say we coded our algorithm. We, let's say you made a bug in your algorithm. And this is something which happens in my group with students all the time, this is a very common bug. I have a book that I will publish one day. It's called The Book of Bugs. It will collect together all the bugs made by students. Some of them are fantastic. And I have lost all my hair trying to debug the codes of my students. That's amazing how you can make bugs when you write a code. So let's say you, sorry, not X2 is equal to X2, but X2 is equal to X1. You do not change. So what I'm telling you here is that you, only if a move makes you move in the high, higher probability direction, you accept it. If it was a move in the lower probability direction, you decline it. And then you iterate it, right? Now, instead of X2, you try to generate an X3, then X4. What will be the end product of such an algorithm? Where will you land? You will land here, right? All the moves that take you to the right, you will reject. And all the moves that take you to the left, you will keep accepting. And at some point, you will land at the top. And then you'll just get stuck there. So this is what, in mathematics, people call a steepest descent algorithm. In, in probability space, it is the steepest ascent algorithm. You just climb to the top of the mountain in probability. In terms of energy, the probability would look like this, right? You have a low energy and you would just fall. You started here and you would just fall to the bottom of the energy. But that's not what you want. This is a bad idea. This will not allow you to equilibrate. This is an optimization problem. You have in fact converts to the local maxima in the probability space. What Metropolis does is to say that if the probability of XT was less than X1, then let's calculate the ratio of P of XT by P of X1, okay? Clearly this ratio is now less than one. Why? Because we are interested only in this case, right? So per construction, it's less than one. And also these, both of these are positive numbers, right? both probabilities are positive, so it's going to be zero this time. So it calls this quantity as K, let's call this as K. Then what it does is to generate a uniform random number between uniform meaning any, using Suhas's algorithm, if any number between zero and one is allowed in, in the interval zero to one. Let's call this as, call as R. If R is less than K, then it accepts X2 equal as XT. If less than equal to K. If R is more than K, then it says don't accept the new move and keep X2 as the same as X1. So this is quite physical. What it has done here, you, you introduced a move which caused the probability to go down, right? It goes and sees, well, how much did it go down by? If your move allowed you to 
forced you to land way out here, then this ratio would be very small, right? It would be close to zero. It would be a very, very small number. Anytime you generate such a random number, where would this random number lie? Most of the times it would lie close to 0.5, right? On an average, it's very, if, so let's say if K is equal to 0 0.00001, which means that you, you were here and your random move tried to take you at the other side of the arrow, then the K would be a very small number, right? And then your R, it's very unlikely that your R would be smaller than 0 0.001 or 0.5 times 0.1, right? R most likely will be much more than K. So you will end up declining this move. You will stay where you are. But once in a while, your moves will be slightly to the right side, right? Okay? And then you will accept that move. So this way, wherever, independent of where you, wherever you start, you will try to go to the minimum, but within fluctuations, you will sample the distribution that you wanted to sample. And that's Metropolis algorithm, Metropolis casting algorithm. So I'll summarize. You start with some starting point X1, you select a perturbation parameter. Now this perturbation parameter, if you make it too large, does anyone see what will be a problem if epsilon is kept too large? Where is Pavan? Is Pavan there? Yeah, I'm here. Pavan, what will go wrong if epsilon is kept too large, the perturbation parameter? Uh, if it's too large, um, then the, if, if you jump away from like what's likely, the probability of that would be really small. Yeah, so most of the moves, if, if you make a move that takes you to higher probability, of course it will get accepted, accepted. But anytime you try to jump to the right side in the probability space, your move is so large that you will get smacked back. It will never be accepted. Yeah, so that's the point. So you want epsilon to be too small. You want it to be small, sorry, not too small. But if you make it too small, the algorithm will work, but it will just become inefficient. So typically, this is an open problem. And typically, people say that you want to preserve a 10% to 20% acceptance ratio in Monte Carlo. So you want 80% of your moves to be rejected and 10 to 20% of your moves to be accepted. If your algorithm is accepting every single move, because either it's going to lower energy or it's going to slightly higher energy, that means you're sampling too slowly. You're not doing the job right. And if your acceptance ratio is smaller than 10%, it means your epsilon parameter is too aggressive. So that's how people tune it typically. They run their Monte Carlo simulation, look for the acceptance ratio. And this is a heuristic. There is no profound proof about it. So the big question is, so now we can write it down more uh, rigorously and I will copy some formula here. So at any, and we can do this at any given state. So at any, at any given time. So let's say at a given time, our microstate is given by mu and we generate a new microstate. We generate a new trial microstate, new prime. So those of you who played with John Weeks' uh, toy model, which I showed you for the ID model, that is implementing this algorithm. So now you have to decide whether the microstate for T plus one, what should it be? So it, it, you will accept this value of new prime whenever delta E, whenever the energy of the system, new new prime is negative or zero. Why? Because this means that the probability stayed the same or it went up or you will accept is it as and now, so one case is if the energy went down. If the energy went down, you always accept it. Now the other case is if the energy went up. If the energy went up, you draw a random number in the interval zero to one, a uniform random number. And you check whether e to the power minus beta delta e new new prime is more than equal to x. If it is more than equal to x, you accept this change. If it is less than x, then you stay where you were, you do not move. And this is the formal statement of the Metropolis algorithm, where delta e 
nu nu prime, the sign matters, is e nu prime minus e nu. So that's the algorithm. I want to make a couple of theoretical statements and then we will stop. Why is this guaranteed to give us a sampling from the canonical ensemble? That's not obvious, right? So why should the above algorithm give us sampling of canonical distribution? Even more fundamentally, perhaps, so there are two questions. So I will actually call this as question number two. And question number one is, why should this algorithm converge? What do I mean by converge? By converge, I mean, I told you that once you draw 100 values from this algorithm, it should give you a mean that corresponds to the mean that you wanted from the true probability distribution. It should give you moments corresponding to the true probability distribution. So what I'm saying here is, let's say you ran it for 100,000 steps, and you got these two to be the same. What is it that tells you that if you went back and ran it another 100,000 times, you won't get a different mean? You know, and this happens in simulations and experiments many times, right? You're running some long experiment, you run it over three days, and you are calculating some property, some diffusivity, some transport coefficient or whatever, and it looks like it kind of converged. How do you really know that it has converged? What if you go and repeat it and it changes to something else? So these are the two theoretical questions that we need to understand. And that brings us, in order to understand, we have to think about something and uh, Chandler, so now I'm following Chandler very carefully for this. So I will use notation from Chandler. So Chandler introduces the notation of W from nu to nu prime. W is defined as the probability per unit time that the system, if in state nu, will move to state new prime, okay? So given this, we can write down an equation which in chemistry shows up in chemical kinetics quite a lot, which is called a master equation. We can write down a master equation for how does the probability of observing the system in a given state new change as a function of time. So this is dp nu by dt. So if, so let, let's imagine it geometrically. We have a state nu, and we have all these other states in which the system can exist. Nu prime, nu double prime, nu triple prime, or essentially nu prime can take any other value. So the way, there are two things that can happen in order to change the probability of observing the system in state nu. Either something, either the system comes in from somewhere else, or the system leaves here to go somewhere out, right? So this is slightly abstract. I'm not talking about probability in a physical space. I'm talking about probability in the state of microstates, okay? So what does that mean? It means that if you were in some other state P nu prime, what is the probability that you leave that other state nu prime and come to nu, right? This will contribute to rate of change of P nu, right? This will have a positive contribution. Or you can think about the probability of being in P nu itself and leaving nu to go to some other nu prime, right? Only thing here is now you have to sum over all possible nu primes, all possible nu prime, including nu. At equilibrium, what do we expect p nu dot to be? What should be the value of p nu dot in equilibrium? What's the definition of equilibrium? How did we start this lecture in this semester in the very first lecture? We said there is no time in thermodynamics or statistical mechanics, right? There is no change with respect to time. Everything has stopped changing. So at equilibrium, P nu dot should be zero. 
for all possible new. Since it is to be true for all possible new, this is equivalent to stay saying that P new prime W new prime new should be equal to P new W new new prime. This relation is a very fundamental relation in equilibrium statistical mechanics. It is called as the relation of delay, uh, principle of detailed balance. If this is true for any system, that means the system is at equilibrium. So more rigorously speaking, this is a sufficient, let's see if I get it right. This is a sufficient, but not necessary condition for equilibrium to hold true. And this is something which is way beyond my, from beyond 687 to show why this statement is true. So, but you can get the essence of it. So what I'm telling you here is that if you can go and show that your system, so what does it say? It tells you go and calculate the probability of being in a state and then calculate the probability of leaving that state and going to some other state. And this has to be true for all pairs, new and new prime. Then go and look at the probability of being in some other state and the probability of leaving that and coming back to this state. This product should be the same. So what I'm telling you here is that this, this principle detail balance if true, if this is true, so detailed balance implies equilibrium. It tells you that the system is at equilibrium. However, I am not writing this as this thing. I'm not saying that equilibrium implies detailed balance. You could have systems in equilibrium where detailed balance is not true, but we are not going to get into that. For, for, for many practical problems, it's okay if you assume it to be equivalent, you won't, but this really runs into questions with non-equilibrium systems as to what does it matter about detail balance. So what I would like you to do is, or let's, let's do it right now. So we actually know already that, so what we have to show that this thing is true for the metropolis algorithm. If this thing is true, then we have basically proven that system follows detail balance and hence it must be going to equilibrium. If you really want to understand the proof for this, you have to go and read something called Boltzmann's H theorem that talks about this. So if we can prove this to be true, then we are done. So how do we prove this for the metropolis algorithm? We already know that P nu prime by P nu at equilibrium is equal to e to the power minus beta delta e nu nu prime, right? And uh, before I forget, I wanna mention that the beauty of this algorithm is it does not require you to calculate the partition function. Do you see that? In order to calculate e to the power, it just requires you to calculate the difference of the energy. It does not require you to, so it's basically it's calculating the ratio of the probabilities it's not calculating the full partition function. That's, that's why part of the reason why it's so advantage, advantageous. So for metro, we have this true at, at equilibrium. We know this. So now we have to think about W nu nu prime. So in Metropolis, you can you know that the probability of going from new to new prime is proportional. We don't know the proportionality constant, but it's proportional to one if delta E new new prime is less than or equal to zero. And it's proportional to e to the power minus beta delta E new new prime if delta E new new prime is more than zero. So I didn't number equations today. Let's call it equation one. Let's call it equation two. Let's call it equation three. So it's easy to see that two and three lead to one for Metropolis algorithm. So Metropolis algorithm uh, valid uh, is it, it follows detailed balance. You can see how, right? Because what is, so what do we want to show? We want to show that P new 
probability of being in a state multiplied by the probability of moving from that state to some other state. And in this notation, be careful. Sometimes you will be reading a paper modeling the kinetics of your system, and you will find that they define W nu nu prime in an opposite way. Here I am saying this is the probability of moving from nu to nu prime. Certain papers will define this as opposite. Nu nu prime will mean moving to nu from nu prime, and that 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 can make things complicated. So we want to show that P nu W nu 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 prime is equal to P nu prime multiplied by W nu prime nu. So, or we want to show that W nu nu prime by W nu prime nu, so W nu nu prime by W nu prime nu is equal to P nu prime by P nu, which we just know from canonical ensemble is this thing, right? So this is what we need to show. And that's trivial given equation three. Why? Because if, so we have two cases now, right? If delta E nu nu prime is less than equal to zero, then this thing will be, one divided by e to the power plus beta delta e nu nu prime, which is the same as this. And if e nu nu prime is more than or equal to zero, this thing will be e to the power minus beta delta e nu nu prime divided by one, which is again the same as this. So what I just sketched you out for here is the proof that Metropolis follows detailed balance, which means it reaches it 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 reaches. Technically speaking, it means that it reaches a stationary state. It reaches. It converges to something. Whether that something is the canonical ensemble or not, there is a bit more argument, but I don't want to get into the math. Basically, this shows since it follows detailed balance through the virtue of the theorem that I did not prove, I just stated it for you, that detailed balance, this condition implies equilibrium. Therefore, Metropolis algorithm generates samples from an equilibrium distribution. And this should not be completely odd to you given this master equation type idea that I wrote that at equilibrium P, P nu dot should be equal to zero. So you can see why this whole thing has to be zero at equilibrium. So that's Monte Carlo simulation. Chandler's book has a whole chapter on it. You can go and read it. It even gives you a code in GW Basic or something as to how it is done. You can find probably better codes in Python and stuff if you want to play with it. So in the remaining seven minutes, I want to recap this semester, if it's possible. And this is the last class. We won't be meeting again, which is very, very sad. But uh, as a follow-up, first of all, some of you might consider, if you enjoyed this class, you will really like taking Chris Jadzinski's uh, advanced statistical mechanics. I don't think it will be taught next year. It will be taught two years from now. Next year, he's on sabbatical. This year, he's teaching, teaching it at the same time as me. So two years from now, if you still like StatMec, you can go and take his class. There, you will think about what does violation of detailed balance mean? That is related to entropy production. And if a system is out of equilibrium, by quantifying how much detailed balance is violated, you can calculate how much entropy is produced and all kinds of wonderful things. He will derive Jarzinski's relation for you, though he will not call it Jarzinski's relation. He's too modest for that. And you can study all kinds of wonderful things. But what we did here in this semester, in spite of the very odd coronavirus related thing, we covered a lot of material, perhaps way too much, but Chandler's book talks about most of it. Some of this stuff I did outside Chandler and uh, you can go and look at my notes. You can talk to me. So we started with chapter one and Chandler was thermodynamics. So I assume that you have done all of that in John Meeks's class or taken something equivalent. So we did not go into that. But then we talked about basically chapter one and two we skipped, which was thermodynamics. We went to chapter three, which is the three ensembles. We thought of a microcanonical ensemble, right? And the key idea in a microcanonical ensemble is everything is equally possible, equal a priori possible probabilities, right? So with that, we said, which means that P nu is equal to constant for every microstate. 
And what is this constant? It is one over the total number of microstates. So that's how we wrote down the first probability. We showed that the microcanonical partition function, which is the number of microstates, gives us the entropy of the system, which led us to the beautiful formula, which is engraved on Boltzmann's grave, Boltzmann's entropy formula, S is equal to K log omega. Then we thought about, well, what if it's not an isolated system? What if the system is coupled to a bath? First, we coupled it to a thermal bath, so mass cannot exchange, but energy can exchange. How do we derive the probability for this? The formula is the uh, e to the power minus beta e nu, and in order to derive it, we thought of the system embedded in a bigger system, and then thought of the full thing as a big isolated system. And we thought that the full thing is much bigger than the smaller system, so we could do Taylor expansion, and that's how we got it. We did the same thing for a grand canonical ensemble, where instead of just doing Taylor expansion in energy, we did Taylor expansion in number also. And uh, both these ensembles have their counterparts in thermodynamics and thermodynamic limit. The canonical partition function gives you the Helmholtz free energy. The grand canonical partition function gives you the grand potential, which is minus beta times E times volume. We also saw something very interesting that you can calculate fluctuations in every one. So given a probability distribution, you can calculate its mean, you can calculate its standard deviation. We showed that the standard deviation divided by mean tends to zero as n tends to infinity or in the thermodynamic limit, which means all ensembles give you the same result once you approach the thermodynamic limit. It's in the small limit that things can be different. So, which also means that for a practical problem, you can pick any ensemble that you want. It might not be easy. It might be trickier as you saw for some of the problems a certain ensemble was easy to it's it's it was easy to solve that problem while a certain other ensemble was a bit harder yet you get the same results then we applied these things to heat capacity of phonons we spent a lot of time about it don't forget ever i hope the debye versus einstein conundrum and how classical mechanics gives us constant heat capacity while Debye and Einstein corrected. Einstein was a bit, always remember Einstein was lazy or maybe he was doing too many things. He just said only one frequency is allowed, which meant that the heat capacity went to zero, but too aggressively. While Debye said, well, how about we allow for more heat frequencies? And that led to a more gradual variation in the heat capacity as it went to zero. We talked about Bose-Einstein, Fermi-Dirac, looked at wonderful properties of that they had. This was all non-interacting system. That's where we, funnily enough, that's when coronavirus happened and we all became non-interacting and we cannot meet each other or do things. But that's when we started study of interacting systems. Fluids, where we introduced the pair correlation function, radial distribution function. That was chapter seven in Chandler. And we derived wonderful properties of these reduced distribution functions. And uh, we showed how this g of we talked about how g of r can be directly calculated from experiments from scattering experiments and gives us wonderful properties about thermodynamics of the system and you, many of you picked uh, the chandler weeks anderson paper and there you saw how it's actually very useful and important we then looked very briefly well not very briefly we look we spent time looking at phase transition at ising model and uh, how we used in very wonder uh, uh, what i think is a beautiful idea of the pearls droplet to show how in one d i think model does not have a phase transition that's something also very generic to remember however in set b there is a paper by uh, kittel which talks about phase transitions in one d so do, do look at it indeed you can get phase transitions in one d if you allow very long range forces and that's what i want you to think about if your forces die very, very slowly, then you might start to get long range interaction even in 1D, you might get the critical temperature. So in 1D, if your system has infinite range interactions, you can still get phase transitions if you can construct such a system. But in 2D and 3D, you can get phase transitions. Mean field theory allowed us to calculate that phase on critical temperature for the phase transition. It did horribly wrong in 1D. As the dimensions became higher, it tended to do better and better. We then looked at, uh, what did we look at? Renormalization group, very briefly, which uh, gave us 
you got a flavor of it, the decimation idea and how it works. I sent you a paper by Cardanoff. That's, so in the next lecture, I don't want to teach you some other topic because I want you to go and look at these papers. I really want you to spend some time allotted for the lecture or otherwise look at the papers, then pick a paper that you like. If you really don't like any of the papers, please email me and I'll assign a special paper to you so that you still go and look at it. But I hope you will find one paper, but you have to pick two. I think you will find two papers at least that you like a lot. And the thing that we did not do from, and today we talked about actual things in practice, how to sample the canonical ensemble in a simulation, which is uniquely generated to, related to generating random numbers, which is Monte Carlo methods, which is a big thing. One of the papers is Wang Landau sampling, which makes this Metropolis algorithm even more effective. And it's worth reading. It's a very popular algorithm. And uh, Monte Carlo can also apply easily to simulations of quantum systems. So in the chapter six in Chandler has a section on quantum Monte Carlo QMC methods. You can read it if you want. And we did not do chapter eight, which is statistical mechanics of non-equilibrium systems. If you pick up the paper by Bruce Byrne and David Chandler that talks about chemical kinetics, then you might benefit from reading chapter eight. It will help you understand that chapter better. So that's it for the semester. Your exams, I will give you your graded midterms. And if you want to, if there is something that is not clear to you, please email me and we can talk about it. And as I mentioned, I know for a fact, you all put in a lot of hard work and I'm, I'm going to be very easy in grading you. And you know it, if you have put in hard work, you know it. I mean, one, there is only one student who did not bother to submit the second midterm. If you submitted the second midterm, I, I assure you, you will get a B plus or higher, but please don't screw up the final. I might change my view if I see that for your final, you submit two pages and you, I don't know, make a smiley on page one and make a smiley on page two. Don't do that. Please make a genuine effort. You will get a B plus or higher. You can still get an A plus in this class. So I'm grading leniently. It will be a curve, but the curve will be restricted to A plus to B plus. Doesn't mean no one will be failing this semester. Some of you really did not stop putting in effort and which means you did not even submit the midterm and that's, that's, that's not good. So, but apart from that, you don't have to worry about grades. I hope you enjoy the paper and I hope you use StatMec in your research. It's a wonderful subject. It's, it's one of those subjects that I do for a living and it makes me feel very happy because it's, it's like, you know, when you get calculus, when you finally get calculus, you realize it's so easy. That's how you feel about, you should feel about StatMec. It's actually very easy. It's intuitive and it's very, very powerful. Okay, so, and I will, grade, I will send you your graded midterms and I will also give you comments on your uh, reports for the midterm and the final exam, but I will do that over the course of the summer. I, I will take it a bit easy. So hope to see you all on campus for your candidacy, your co-ops or something else, okay? Have a nice semester, bye-bye. Thank you, Dr. Bye. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you.